Shalom, shalom, and thank you for joining me today in this study called, When Does the Day Begin? <laughs> now, I did a similar study several years ago, and it was actually one of my first videos I ever did. So, I thought it was time to remake this video because in a lot of my studies, I try to cover as much ground as I can and give as much information as I can, but sometimes that makes the video quite lengthy. And so this is a subject that's, that's really important. And so I thought I would just cut to the chase in this video, remake it, and give the information that people are looking for on this subject. So, when does the day begin and end? You know, the Creator's timekeeping ways have been distorted by history and influenced by captivity. Hallel, aka Lucifer, is very sneaky. He does not want you to know that the first order of business is learning when to observe Yahuwah's holy set times. His reason is simple. If you do not know how to tell Yahuwah time, then you will miss the appointed times to meet with our Creator, which is what Lucifer wants. Thankfully, Yahuwah told his prophets, like Enoch and Zechariah, that he would be restoring his division of time to his elect in the end of days. Hallelujah. Enoch 1, 2. And Enoch, the blessed and righteous man of Yahuwah, took up his parable while his eyes were open and he saw and said, This is a Kodesh, a holy vision from the heavens, which the Malachim, which the angels showed me. And I heard from them everything, and I understood. I look not for this generation, but for the distant one. This word distant one means a remote place or time, a remote generation. The distant one that is coming, I speak about the elect ones and concerning them. Now, if we remember in Enoch, he's telling Methuselah that he's giving him all this information to pass on to his children and his children's children. So this information was to be passed down through the ages. This information has been distorted and lost through time. And Zechariah also echoes the words of Enoch. Zechariah 6.15 And the distant ones. Again, a remote place or time, a remote generation, shall come and build. They shall restore, set up the house of Yahuwah. Now, this doesn't mean Yahuwah's temple or some church. Yahuwah's dwelling, Yahuwah's house, is the covered over garden of set times. This is where he dwells. This is where he kicked man out of because of his sin. But he says that he will restore this to the end time generation. And you shall know that the creator of hosts has sent me to you. And this shall be if listening. You will listen to the voice of Yahweh, your creator. So this is from Zechariah. So, one division of time that you think would be simplistic is, when does the day begin? Right? Ask any child, and they will tell you that the day begins when the sun comes up. 
And doesn't the Messiah tell us to be childlike? Yet many, many adults hotly debate this very question every day. Mostly because some suppose that the Jewish people are the Creator's elect. And since they start the day at the setting of the sun, then that must be correct. But people tell me that all the time. Now, I personally have nothing against the Jewish people. But our Creator's elect is called Israel. And although the house of Judah is, in large part, the house of Israel, which actually is a whole different study there, the prophets tell us that Yahuwah took his appointed times away from the house of Judah and away from the house of Israel due to her idolatry until the end of days when they will be restored. And he tells us that they will be restored to them through the Gentiles, which technically is where the house of Israel is found right now amongst the nations. So let us go directly to the instructions themselves to find the answer to this question. The best place to start is always at the beginning of things. So let's go to Genesis 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning, Yahuwah created the heavens and the earth, and the earth became to be formless and empty, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Ruach of Eloah was moving on the face of the waters. And Eloah said, Let light come to be. And light came to be. And Eloah saw the light, that it was good. And Eloah separated the light from the darkness. And Eloah called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there came to be evening, and there came to be morning, the first day. Now before we go any further, we need to take a moment to look at a few definitions that pertain to these scriptures in order for us to get a clear picture. The word morning in Hebrew is boker, and it means a breaking, dividing, separation, as in the sun breaking the horizon. Properly, it means dawn. Then evening, erev, is a mixing or blending. It means dusk. There is both light and darkness, in which the light was there prior to the darkness. Then we have night, Layla, properly a twisting away of the light, that is, night, dark, figuratively, adversity. Then the word first. Now the word used in this scripture is not the word Rishon, the Hebrew word meaning first, in place, time, or rank, but rather a cod, which means properly united or a coupling. Then we have day, which is yom. A day is either from sunrise to sunset, as in a 12-hour period, or from one sunrise to the next, as in a 24-hour period, or a space of time defined by an associated term. So in other words, the word day has different meanings depending on the context in which it is used, either referring to the period of daylight or the second term for day, which is a 24-hour period or from sunrise to sunrise. The first day of creation then defines for us when a day starts. After the light was spoken into existence, we are told that it came to be evening. One must understand that something cannot come to be unless it was in some other state. It could not come to be evening unless it was something other than evening. And it could not come to be morning unless it was something other than morning. The sequence begins with the light and ended with the light. 
From the Peak's commentary on the Bible, we read, quote, To the light he gives the name day, to the darkness the name night. Thus, the work of the first day, reckoned from morning to morning, is accomplished. The period of light is followed by evening and darkness, which comes to an end with the next morning when the second day begins. Unquote. Then, let's read from the first book of Moses, and it says, quote, It is not till after the light had been created and the separation of light from the darkness had taken place that evening came, and after the evening the morning. It follows from this, that the days of creation are not reckoned from evening to evening, but morning to morning. Unquote. Genesis 1.16, And Yahuwah made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. Well, if Yahuwah made the greater light to rule the day, then we must ask ourselves, why would Yahuwah start a day with the lesser light? Doesn't that just go against what we read? And the encyclopedia Dictionary of the Bible states, quote, The nighttime is considered as belonging to the preceding period of daylight. From this there developed the meaning of day in the sense of the cycle made up of one period of daylight and one period of darkness, or according to our modern reckoning, 24 hours. From the natural viewpoint, the 24-hour day begins at sunrise. However, besides this conception, there arose another idea of the 24-hour day according to which this daily period began at sunset. It is no doubt the lunar calendar of the Jews which gave rise to this viewpoint. Although the earlier computation did not die out completely, the custom of considering the day as beginning at sunset became general in later Jewish times. Unquote. It was at this time when the lunar reckoning came into the temple with the Pharisees and the Sadducees that the sons of Zadok, or otherwise known as the Essenes, stood up for the old ways and left the corruption as they could no longer participate in the new temple rituals. That's the whole reason why the sons of Zadok left the temple and moved out to the desert, because the Pharisees and the Sadducees were bringing in this loony solar calendar, and it went against the old ways. So they could no longer have their celebrations together because the Pharisees, Sadducees, sages, the scribes, they were all following the moon now. And so obviously these days wandered now that the moon was reckoning them over the solar where the days were stable. And so they just didn't match up anymore, the old with the new. So the sons of Zadok just got tired of all the bickering and decided to move out to the desert and continue practicing the old ways. Then let's look also at the order of things. Notice the order of the natural processes that Yahuwah has arranged. Genesis 8.22 As long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Exodus 13.21 And Yahuwah went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. And this is what Yahuwah has to say about the order of day and night. Jeremiah 33, verses 20 through 21. Thus says Yahuwah, If you could break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that there not be 
day and night in their season, then my covenant could also be broken. Jeremiah 33, 25 through 26, thus saith Yahuwah, if my covenant is not with the day and night, and if I have not appointed the laws of heaven and earth, then I could also reject the descendants of Jacob. So in other words, he's saying this is the way things are naturally. And if you can change them, then you have the power to break my covenant. But since you can't change the way I set this order, then you have no power to break my covenant. <laughs> oh, I love the way he words things and puts them into perspective, don't you? Note that the covenant is with the light first, then the night. We see again in Psalms the sequence of day and night. Psalms 1 verse 2. But his delight is in the law of Yahuwah, and in his law he does meditate day and night. Psalms 74.16 The day is thine, and the night also is thine. Thou hast prepared the light and the sun. It is significant that in the second temple, throughout his entire existence, the practice seems to have been, in all ritual matters, to reckon the day from dawn to dawn, and not according to the later practice from sunset to sunset. Even the rabbis, who themselves reckon the day from sunset to sunset and refuse to admit the legitimacy of any other practice, or rather, absolutely ignored all divergent practice, nonetheless had to admit the validity of the interpretation of Leviticus 7.15, which reads, And the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offering for thanksgiving shall be eaten the same day it is offered. He shall not leave any of it until the morning. Obviously, the implication here is that the next morning is no longer a part of the day upon which the sacrifice was offered, but marked the beginning of the next day. In an article by E. Cohen in 1906, he maintains that two distinct calendars were used in ancient Israel. The first, a solar calendar. This solar calendar was well adapted to the conditions of the simple agricultural life which the Israelites lived during the first period of their sojourn in Palestine. It reckoned the day from sunrise. The second calendar was the lunisolar year. This second calendar was based upon Babylonian models and was adopted under direct Babylonian influence at about 600 BC when Babylonian religion and general culture began to affect with steadily increasing force the Hebrew exiles in Babylonia. Cohen's conclusion is this, quote, the time of the transition from the reckoning of the day as beginning with morning to the reckoning of it as beginning with evening, that in the earlier calendar and in the literature, it records this, the day was reckoned from the morning, presumably from sunrise, while in later calendar and literature pertaining thereto, the day was reckoned from evening. Elsewhere, we have presented quite a mass of evidence which establishes conclusively that the earlier practice in Israel during the biblical period was to reckon the day from sunrise to sunrise. That in the earliest period of Israelite sojourn in Palestine under calendar one, the day was reckoned from morning to morning, is established by a superabundance of evidence. 
This, in turn, together with other important considerations, would point to a time approximately about the beginning of the first half of the 3rd century BC as that of the introduction of the new system of reckoning the day. Unquote. Genesis 2, 1 And the heavens and the earth were completed, and all the cosmos of them. Verse 2 And Eloah completed the sixth day of his work which he did, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he did. And Eloah blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, for in it he rested from all his work which Yahuwah began to do. To clarify when a day starts, Scripture informs us that Yahuwah rested and blessed the seventh day, not the sixth night, as a full day in the creation account is defined by starting with the light and ending with the light. The creation account divides a week into seven equal parts, each of which is called a day. This is later developed in Yahuwah's covenant with the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. Exodus 20 verse 9, Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Verse 11, for in six days Yahuwah made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore Yahuwah blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Since for each of the six days the whole 24-hour period is available for working, then it follows that the whole 24-hour period of the seventh day is to be the Sabbath. Matthew 28, 1. And the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn, towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Mark 16, verses 1 and 2. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had brought sweet spices that they might come to anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. Luke 24, 1. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they come unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. From Matthew 28, verse 1, it might be inferred that the practice of reckoning the day from sunset to sunset was not universal in Israel, but in certain circles, the older practice continued. This is also seen in the parallel passages of Mark 16 1 and Luke 23 56 through 24 1. So we see, and then of course throughout the Gospels, we see these differences of what Yahshua is doing and his followers and where the Jewish feasts are called out. I mean, how many times we see in the scriptures, in the Gospels, that it's the Jewish feast, it's the Jewish Passover, it's the Jewish Sabbath. Over and over again, we see that in the Gospels. So why is this distinction made of what Yahshua and his followers are doing and what the Pharisees and the other Jewish sects are doing? Remember, the Messiah was a Nazarene, and the Nazarenes were a sect of the Essenes, a sect of the sons of Zadok, and he followed their calendar. Now, this isn't a secret calendar. It was well known in the time of Yahshua. The scenes are listed as one of the top three sects in Judaism by the historians. So if the scenes were that prominent, the sons of Zadok, then their calendar and their practices were well known and well preached. So this was not secret in the time of Yahshua. And we can see in the gospel how there is that division of time between the Jews and the sons of Zadok. 
and the Nazarenes. And then we're told also that Yahuwah descends at sunrise. Now Moses brought forth Israel to meet Yahuwah, who descends on Mount Sinai at the coming of the sunrise. Yahuwah had the Israelites prepare and purify themselves for three days. On the third day at sunrise, Yahuwah appears. Exodus 19, 16 and 17. And it came to pass on the third day, happening towards dawn, Boker. And there were voices and lightnings and overcast clouds upon Mount Sinai. The voice of the trumpet sounded greatly, and all the people in camp were terrified. And Moses led the people for a meeting with Yahuwah from the camp, and they stood by the mountain. Now the first rays of light in the morning are an appointed time to meet with Yahuwah, as we understand through the story of Jacob and the angel. Genesis 32, starting with verse 24. And Jacob was left behind alone, and a man wrestled with him until morning. And he saw that he was not able to prevail against him, and he touched the wide part of his thigh, and he paralyzed the wide part of the thigh of Jacob in his wrestling with him. And he said to him, You send me away, for the dawn ascended. And he said, No way will I send you away if you should not bless me. Verse 31, And the sun arose to him. Then he passed over the side of Yahuwah, but he was limping in his thigh. Jacob wrestled with an angel, and when darkness began to twist away into light, the angel demanded Jacob let him go. As to the reason why the angel had to leave at sunrise has confused many. Yet, if one understands that all the heavenly hosts are required to attend these appointed hours of prayer, the question could be easily answered. By Yahuwah's ordained Torah law, all are required to attend, even the angels in heaven. From the Revelation of Paul, we read, quote, All the angels at the appointed hour meet for the worship of Eloah. Whenever, therefore, at the appointed hour, the angels of pious men come, rejoicing and singing psalms, they meet for the worship of Eloah. Unquote. While the radiance of the stars diminish, and darkness retreats, the night comes to an end, and a new day begins. We are to start our day in the presence of our Creator, where we are to get our instructions, and the end of the day we spend rejoicing in Him. As the day progresses, the sun reaches its peak above the horizon, then begins a gradual descent to the west, returning to the horizon where we say it has set. The sunlight diminishes as it continues to decline below the horizon to the point at which the rays of sun are no longer visible. Darkness returns, the stars and moon appear, remaining until the earliest rays of the sun tells us that another day has begun. Both the manna and quail account are witnesses as to when the day begins as well. Exodus 16, 22 through 27. And it came to be on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said to them, This is what Yahuwah has said. Tomorrow is a rest, a Sabbath set apart to Yahuwah. That which you bake, bake, and that which you cook, cook, and lay up for yourselves all that is left over to keep until 
morning. And they laid it up till morning as Moses commanded. And it did not stink, and no worm was in it. And Moses said, Eat it today, for today is the Sabbath to Yahuwah. Today you do not find it in the field. Yahuwah said, Tomorrow was the Sabbath. Then morning comes, and Moses said, Eat it today, for today is the Sabbath. Clearly showing that when the morning came, it was the beginning of a new day. Exodus 18.13 And it came to be on the next day that Moses sat to rightly rule the people. And the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. We see once again that the next day starts in the morning. Numbers 11.18 And you shall say to the people, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat flesh. For you have wept in the ears of Yahuwah, saying, Who shall give us flesh? For we had good in Egypt. And Yahuwah shall give flesh to you, and you shall eat. Verse 32, And the people were up all that day, and all that night, and all the next day, and gathered the quail. He who has least gathered ten omers, and they spread them out for themselves around the camp. So we see the sequence of that day belongs to that night. Then the next day comes. And then during the golden calf incident, we read about Aaron proclaiming a false feast to Eloa, commencing at the start of the next day, the following morning. The Oxford Companion to the Bible reads, quote, In earlier traditions, a day apparently began at sunrise. Later, its beginning was at sunset, and its end at the following sunset. This system became normative and is still observed in Jewish tradition, unquote. So we see here that, and over and over again, we've read that it was the earlier ways of the Hebrews to begin the day at sunrise. It wasn't until later that the Jewish traditions came in and they changed it to the evening to evening reckoning. So these are but a few examples with so many scriptural references defining the day and when it begins. How can we be compelled to hold to the traditions of evening to evening? Now, before you answer that question, in all fairness, we should look at the other scriptures that may give implication to the day or Sabbath beginning at night. And we're going to start with Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And we read in Leviticus 23, verses 26 through 32. And Yahuwah spoke to Moses, saying, On the tenth day of this seventh month is the Day of Atonement, Yom HaKippurim. It shall be a holy convocation to you. You do no work, a law forever throughout your generations, in all your dwellings. It is a Sabbath of rest for you, and you shall afflict your being on the ninth day of the month at evening. From the evening to evening, you observe your Sabbath. Okay, so in the context of this ordinance, the Sabbath for the Day of Atonement differs from the regular weekly Sabbaths and the other annual feast days other than Pesach, and we'll be talking about that in a moment. So Yahuwah specified that this particular Sabbath is to be kept from evening to evening. He had to specify it. He makes it clear by numbering the days. The Day of Atonement is on the tenth day, as we're told, but the fast commences, it starts 
on the ninth day at evening. Now, why would Yahuwah command us to start the fast on the ninth day at evening if the tenth day started evening anyhow? That would just be confusion. And Yahuwah has no part in confusion. <laughs> Nowhere in scripture is it stated or even implied that the day, weekly Sabbath, or holy days begin at the evening, with the two exceptions called out in Scripture. Like I said, Day of Atonement and Passover. So then why would Yahuwah specifically say that this fast should begin from the evening if it were well known that all Sabbaths began at the evening? It would not have been necessary to specify the starting and finishing times of this one and fail to do the same for the other Sabbaths. So he's given us special instructions for this special day. Applying biblical truth to biblical truth, we obtain the following results. The morning of the 10th would be the start of the 10th day. The previous evening would indeed have been the evening of the ninth, which matches perfectly with what Yahuwah had said. The fast was to run from the evening of the ninth day to just when the evening returned after sunset on the tenth day. There is no problem in understanding and applying Yahuwah's instructions when we accept the biblical fact that the day starts in the morning and not at evening. Doors to Yahuwah's truth are easily unlocked when we use Yahuwah's keys. Now to the Passover. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, between the evenings is the Passover. Between the evenings. That doesn't mean from afternoon to sundown. That's not between the evenings. That would be between evening and night. He's saying between the evenings. So from the sunset of the 14th of the following sunset is the Passover. So he says between the evenings is the Passover of Yahuwah. The daylight hours are the preparation time for the night's events as proclaimed by Yahuwah. He specifies that the party starts in the evening of the 14th day. If your day starts in the evening and then you try to celebrate the Passover as instructed, you would have passed into the 15th according to an evening to evening reckoning. And this is what we see happening at the time of the Messiah's crucifixion because of the way the Jews reckon the day. His death transpired the evening after he himself observed the rightful priestly Passover with his people on the 14th, as scripture instructs. With an evening to evening day, you would have to begin your Passover preparation on the 13th day in order to eat it on the 14th. And that too is incorrect according to the word. Exodus 12, 6 through 8. And you shall keep it until the 14th day. Not the 13th day. The 14th. Not the 15th. Not the 13th. The 14th of the same month. Then all the assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it between the evenings. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts of the lintel of the houses where they eat it, and they shall eat the flesh on that night. Roasted in fire, with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. So we see that the lamb must be slaughtered before sundown on the 14th, and eaten after sundown also on the 14th. The Feast of Unleavened Bread follows on from the Passover, continuing with the theme of the feast. Exodus twelve eighteen. In the first month on the 14th day of the month, in the evening you shall eat unleavened bread 
until the 21st day of the month in the evening. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover, it all starts on the 14th day at evening when we're to eat the bread and the lamb. The combined Passover and eating of unleavened bread for seven days was a unique commemoration of the deliverance of the children of Israel from Egypt's bondage. Yahuwah's instruction to all generations is that the timing of his celebration at twilight should be the same as had occurred on that memorable first Passover in Egypt. The celebrations of Passover and unleavened bread were to be a reenactment of the original events. The weekly Sabbath, on the other hand, is a weekly remembrance of the seventh day on which Yahuwah rested after his work of creation. It is not in any way a replay of the Exodus. Therefore, the timing at evening on the Passover and unleavened bread cannot be assumed to be pertinent to the weekly Sabbath or to indicate when the days begin. There is just no biblical fact to support it. If one arbitrarily says that the sun does not determine when the day begins, or the day begins when the lesser lights are in charge, or that darkness tells us when the Sabbath day begins and not the sun, let us not forget Hallel's subtle challenge to Yahuwah when he asks Kava, when he asks Eve in the Garden of Eden, has Yahuwah indeed said? Yahuwah indeed said, let there be light, and there was light. We are not to start our worship of the one and only in the dark. We are instructed to be there as the dawn is breaking with the angels to receive the new day's instructions. <laughs> Hallelujah. So this is the conclusion of our study on when does the day begin and end. And I hope this brings more clarity and plenty of witnesses to show us the division of Yahuwah's day. So I hope you've enjoyed this study and I'm going to give all praise and glory to the Most High. And until we meet again, I will wish you Shalom. 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 Shalom.